and hello, Tom. Good to see you. Good to see you. Am I allowed to ask you first? Sure, absolutely. Let me ask you first. It, it, it's been such a slow week. We've all been talking about science policy over yes. this the major concern. <laughs> what do you think are the lessons we should learn from some of the things that have been happening, like the NASA SpaceX partnership? Seems to be going great. Michael Kramer's work on advanced market commitments seems far more important than ever. Generally, the work of Schmidt Futures and others on incentive prizes. What are we learning? Not nothing about Pennsylvania, Arizona, the real stuff. Tell us. Yeah. So uh, let me tell you about uh, a couple of those ideas and, and sort of what they have in common, because I think there is a, a family resemblance to them. So when the U.S. retired the space shuttle, we the U.S. government had to start paying the Russians $80 million per astronaut uh, to get up to the space station. Uh, and so what NASA did with SpaceX and some other uh, commercial companies is they said, we want a rocket that will go up to the International Space Station, deliver and retrieve cargo, and ultimately astronauts. And as you make progress towards that goal, we will provide some milestone payments. And that allowed uh, NASA to get access to a capability for roughly $400 million that would have cost them uh, 1.8 to 4 billion and po possibly even much more than that had they used a business as, as usual approach. Um, similarly, uh, Michael Kramer's work led to five countries in the Gates Foundation going to pharmaceutical companies like GSK and Pfizer and saying, if you develop a vaccine, which is safe and effective, then we will provide a copay uh, of $7 per dose. Uh, and that one decision uh, has saved the lives of hundreds of thousands of uh, kids in, in low-income countries because in the absence of that, uh, pharmaceutical companies are, are not going to work on vaccines for diseases of the poor. When I worked for President uh, Clinton and Obama, I was able to get DARPA prize authority, which they used for the self-driving car competition. And then when I came back into government during the Obama administration, uh, I was able to work with the House and Senate to get every agency prize authority for up to $50 million. So what do these things have in common? Number one, uh, the government or the sponsor, uh, of whether it's a prize or an advanced market commitment uh, or a set of milestone payments is establishing a goal, <clears throat> but it's, it's uh, being less prescriptive about uh, how to get there. Uh, in, in many cases, the government is saying we're willing to de bear the demand risk if the companies bear the performance risk. Um, and so I think we should be doing more of that. One of, one of the things that I think is really uh, strange is that the government has very well developed and widely used uh, mechanisms for making financial commitments that are contingent on failure. Uh, uh, those are called loan guarantees. So that's the government saying, all right, if Tyler goes bankrupt, then the United States will assume Tyler's debt obligations. And we are just barely scratching the surface on our ability to make financial commitments that are contingent on success. So in those areas that are important for society, where we believe that the private sector will underinvest, whether like vaccines for diseases of the poor uh, or new antibiotics, a situation where the government says uh, we're going to establish a goal, but we're going to allow the private sector uh, to figure out what's the best way to achieve that goal. We'll bear the demand risk if you bear the performance risk, and we make financial commitments that are contingent on success rather than failure. We should be doing a lot more of that. And your colleague uh, Alex uh, Tabarrok has been. Uh, part of a group that has been uh, taking some of these tools of in, uh, of incentive design and applying them to uh, the pandemic as well. Okay, so th those are all improvements in science policy. So maybe, maybe, maybe there's a small possibility there'll be a new administration coming in. If we want to think about what's the general method figuring out how to do improvements in science policy, I mean, what is that method? What's the thought experiment we should apply? 
what's the general way of thinking about science that we can do better, you know, this time than we've ever done before in the past? How do you yeah. see that? Yeah, so uh, I think it's complicated because we have one more than one goal that we're trying to achieve, right? So for, for we, we have specific instrumental goals. For example, we want to allow Americans to lead longer, healthier lives. We want to address the current pandemic and dramatically improve our ability to respond to future pandemics. Uh, we want to have the emergence of new general purpose technologies that lead to faster economic growth and a productivity and, and rising standards of living. So there are some instances where we have some particular goal that we're trying to achieve that we can articulate. And then we have other cases where we're just trying to expand the frontiers of human knowledge uh, about ourselves and the world around us. And that has will have serendipitous uh, benefits. So for example, uh, you know, if I told you that it was of strategic national importance to understand why jellyfish glow in the dark, uh, you might be skeptical about that. But it Not turned me. out no, no, I'm sold on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but it turned out that that's how we discovered green fluorescent protein, which has been absolutely essential for for biomedical research. So I think part of the challenge is that we don't have a single objective uh, function. So I can't say, oh, we should always do X or we should always do Y. Uh, like a lot of areas that are complicated, um, uh, the answer is it depends. Uh, but I think one of the things that we should be doing is applying the experimental method to science policy. And I'll, I'll give you one example of this, which is uh, Pierre Azoulay, uh, who's an economist, said, well, should we support people or projects? Um, and he did some research using a quasi-experimental approach that said, you know, if we compare foundations like the Howard Hughes Medical Institute that bet on people uh, and give them a, mo a lot more flexibility, that seems to be uh, more productive uh, in terms of genuinely transformative research uh, than, uh, you know, supporting particular projects. Um, and you know, the NIH said, well, we don't think the comparison group was totally fair, et cetera, et cetera. So there were quibbles about the methodology, but the result was sufficient to get NIH to say, well, maybe we should try this too. Um, and they set up a bunch of programs and they did evaluation and said, lo and behold, uh, there seems to be an argument for betting on people rather than projects. And so at the margin, they've done more than that. So what, one of the things that, that I'd be interested in talking to you about is you've been uh, an in intellectual leader in the field of progress studies. Um, and so are there some hypotheses that uh, you think are bubbling up from those communities uh, that where we could actually do an experiment uh, and try something out and, 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 you know, see if it works because, you know, I don't know about you, but uh, I, I've, uh, over time, I think I've become more epistemologically modest. And so when someone has a new idea, uh, my first inclination is to say, uh, you know, can we try it out and see if it works before saying that we're going to have a wholesale change in, in a particular area of public policy? There may be crises where, you know, uh, we do need bold and decisive action, even in the absence of strong evidence. But I think if, if, if possible, uh, we should test out ideas and, and have uh, a, uh, you know, a, a bias towards experimentation as opposed to saying we know what the right answer is. So uh, I think my there question are so you, many Tyler, ideas is, yeah, where is, we should is, be testing and running experiments yeah. in philanthropy and in science funding. Mm -hmm. so just one simple example is <clears throat> are the decision making committees too large or should mm -hmm. they be smaller? Yes. It is my personal view that more of the sector should be either, you know, a group of three or even a single person to encourage the system to take more chances. That right. large group, there's a tendency to, to select the least common denominator for yes. projects where no one is offended. Yes. I also at the margin would like to see more what I call approval voting for projects. So say you have a committee of 10. 
And that's just what, what you're stuck with, whether for better or worse. You don't have majority rule. You don't have consensus. But if there are, say, three or four very enthusiastic voices, you do it no matter what. Yeah. Now, that, so, again, you could test over time how yeah. well it does as a rule. Yeah. Uh, so the Gates Foundation for their Grand Challenges program uses a gold star system where, where everyone who's on the peer review can say, I want to bet on this individual. I don't care what the rest of you think. And I think what that probably does is it increases the um, the dispersion of outcomes and maybe allows you to get some things that were sort of high risk, high return. And if you were using consensus, you'd have one person on the committee who says, oh, you know, Tyler's never going to be able to do that. Uh, but if, if you give everyone a gold star, then you might uh, uh, have a group process that, that leads to uh, some things that are, are gen more, more in the sort of genuinely transformative category than high risk, high return. And I think we should challenge the premise that all decisions need to be made slowly in my own project, Past Grants, uh, we created new methods of refereeing where we got people back answers, usually within 48 hours, but at the very latest within two weeks. It's not that I think the whole sector should be run that way, but again, at the margin, we want to have more different methods, just like today's universities, their methods for tenure, how they set up committees, how they do hiring. It's too much alike across schools, and foundations are not as conformist, but there's still a general sense of there being too much paperwork. It takes too much time and energy for people to apply for grants. Just in passing, I should note this is absolutely not true of Schmidt Futures, just to be entirely clear. <laughs> and I commend you all for that, but I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Sure. And researchers complain to me and others all the time, like, well, they won't get an answer until six to nine months from now, right? With COVID, that's a death sentence for many, many people. Yeah. Or they will just say, uh, I can't apply for a very small grant. Or they'll say, like, 30%, 40% of my time is eaten up applying for grants. And a lot of that actually is just paperwork. The actual decision is often made on a relatively small subset of the relevant information. So what I'm interested in, both as a intellectual but also as a doer, is at the margin redesigning arts of philanthropy to be quicker, less bureaucratic, in some ways more like Vannevar Bush, or in some ways even like more of some of the Italian Renaissance patrons or the patrons of Mozart and Beethoven. And they had a lot of failures, but they also had some pretty amazingly good records. And they did it all uh, without information technology in our contemporary sense. And to right. me, it's striking how much of our progress we use to slow things down rather than right. to speed things up. Right. So I guess the question I would have for you is what would motivate people uh, uh, to take some of these ideas and write them down and say, here's a proposal for an experimental design uh, that either a, you know, a philanthropist could do or a government agency could do. Uh, because um, you know, in my 16 years in the White House, one of the things I learned is if you want someone to do something, make it as easy as possible. So if you go to them and say, hey, uh, how would you like to do, uh, uh, apply the experimental method to science policy, right? But, so you could ask them a very vague question like that, or you could say, hey, look at how many study sections you have. Uh, or aren't there some fraction of those where you'd be willing to try out some group process? And it's difficult for, from a you know, rhetorical uh, uh, level for someone who is a science administrator to be against the scientific method. It's, it's a difficult argument for them to make. So I think my view is that there would be a real value uh, for the people involved in progress studies in the science of science policy to say, here, do a little bit of agenda setting. Here are, you know, an experiments. Here's the hypothesis that we'd be trying to test. Here are some of the key experimental design questions. Um, and I, I think there'd be a real value to doing that. And then shopping it around to both the science agencies and, and science philanthropists. My own field, economics, has been grossly negligent in this regard. So I think economics of science should be one of the five most important economic topics. 
along with, say, unemployment, economic growth, then should come economics of science. We don't treat it as amongst 30 most important topics, but I was very heartened. I was looking at the MIT economics job market page. There's a new job market candidate. I believe her name's Natalie Stein, if I recall correctly. She has four papers on economics of science. They look great. Uh, she works with Pierre Azoulay, whom you mentioned before. And I think actually my field is waking up that these things really matter. If you think about climate change, if you think about the pandemic, none of these problems can be solved without science. And science right now to the American public, it's a mix of less popular, less vocal, less trusted than I believe it was when I was growing up. That itself, I would like to see measured. Like what exactly do people not trust about science right now? How have we gotten into the state of affairs where science itself is polarized and people bicker about things like mask wearing, which are low yeah. cost, benefits might be uncertain, but in expected value terms, you know, <laughs> right. 100 to 1 ratio or more, probably much more. Right. So I think we need to understand the problem better. We need philanthropists, what you've done, what I'm trying to do, actually supporting more people working on science, the history of science, science of science, creating databases important for studying science. And I think if, if we lead by example, you know, the Natalie Steins of the world, this woman at MIT, she will do well, others will follow and see this is also in their self-interest to create a body of work on important topics. Right, right. So so make this the next sort of randomista idea that kind of takes off within the uh, economic profession. That's not only economics, but economics yeah, has been sure. one of the most backward places. Yeah. Uh, well, you, to your point, a, a point that you made is like, where are the kind of organizational biographies of institutions like the National Science Foundation or the National Institutes of Health? It's hard to find them. There's something out there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so I have another question for you, um, sure. which is that in the natural sciences and engineering, um, we have a set of policies and, and practices and institutions for trying to move ideas from the lab to the market. Um, and so we have tech transfer offices, we have the buy dole law, we have incubators, uh, we teach scientists and engineers how to become entrepreneurs, we have a curriculum <clears throat> that builds on concepts like the business model canvas and customer discovery where uh, people learn how to go out and talk to 100 potential customers. And so all those things can be approved, uh, but they at least exist. And the, the, the question I have is, what would be kind of analogous institutions when you're talking about an idea from the social and behavioral sciences? So the work that Michael Kramer did working with the Center for Global Development to go from an NPER paper to a, a group of five countries in the Gates Foundation actually doing this. Um, the, the work that you've done around this FAST grants, uh, the work, some of the work that your colleague Alex uh, Tabarak has done around dominant assurance contracts. So what, what are the an, analogous sort of institutions for encouraging more, uh, uh, you know, particularly post-tenure academics who have an idea uh, to not stop at writing the paper, but to, to say, what's the entrepreneurial role that I could play in terms of actually demonstrating the efficacy of this idea? Well, first, universities ought to support this more. They will all talk at you till you're blue in the face about STEM. And they do mean that, but part of STEM is studying science itself, right? Yeah. Not yeah. just producing people who are programmers. I'm modestly hopeful on that front. The National Science Foundation, I would like to say, see take a bigger role. And they will tell you they've done plenty. I, I've seen their list of what they've done. But I'm quite radical here. Imagine the NSF deciding that a third of the new economics research they're going to support is going to be about science. I think yeah. they should do something like that. Uh, yeah. The NIH itself could do more to support the study of science in addition right. to just supporting science, which they've done, right. obviously, an enormous amount. But uh, think tanks. Uh, I've heard that R Street Institute is now starting a program in science policy. So you need also intermediaries. And finally, teaching more academics how to fundraise for their own work. Well, I think help them create that kind of bridging work that doesn't necessarily get you tenure, 
doesn't necessarily make you rich, but if you really care about it, you can find means of supporting it. Yeah, so we have this concept in, in particularly in the biological sciences of translational research. You know, that is, what are the I intermediate steps between understanding the mechanism of disease and then having a, a therapy, a device, a diagnostic or, or a vaccine? Um, and I think that we need a similar concept for the social and behavioral sciences. So that if someone has an idea for a new institution, um, you know, one of my favorite quotes from an economist is from Paul Romer, who says, you know, in the same way that there are all these ideas in the natural sciences and engineering uh, that could lead to economic growth and job creation and productivity, the same thing is true with respect to institutional innovation. Um, you know, wh whether it's the creation of the land grant college or, and university or uh, other institutional innovations like that, um, what what are those types of ideas? You know new ideas for decentralized funding of, of uh, local public goods, for example. Um, <clears throat> you know, I just made two prizes through Mercatus Center. There were two new individuals, in one case a group, writing blogs about the history of science and science policy and progress in science. Uh, one is Anton Howes. He lives in the United Kingdom. Yep. The other is a, a site called Works in Progress. It's just <laughs> all about science and progress. And I think both Anton and the group behind that blog, they're doing a lot to get ordinary, educated, intelligent people interested in science and also making it intellectually glamorous. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, uh, you know, the Dean Kamen, who's a serial entrepreneur and inventor, said in a free society, uh, you get what you celebrate. Uh, and a, a, a comment that Tom Frieden made uh, which was a, a while ago, so it's somewhat out of date. He said, our, our problem is that in China, Bill Gates is Britney Spears. In the United mm -hmm. States, Britney Spears is Britney <laughs> Spears. So, you know, one of the things that, I'm, that uh, Eric Schmidt and I have written about is this idea of a moonshot culture. Uh, so what would it take for, uh, you know, say five, 10 years from now, uh, part of the expectations of what it means to be a leader in the 21st century whether you're the head of a university or the CEO of a company or the head of a science agency or, or foundation, is that you are involved in the identification and pursuit of some really ambitious and important goal in the same way that Bill Gates wants to eradicate polio and Elon Musk has said, I want to die on Mars, but not on impact, or President Obama unveiled the Brain Initiative, which is trying to do for neuroscience what the Genome Project did for genetics. Um, and so to me, a moonshot culture means at least two things. Number one, more people are involved in this process of both the identification and pursuit of these really ambitious and barely achievable goals, number one. But number two, uh, you know, uh, the media and America's storytellers um, are making, are, are covering the people who are pursuing these things. Uh, and that, um, you know, as you said, they have more higher status uh, than sort of vapid influencers on, on Instagram. I would like to understand better how science idols, so to speak, are created through media and entertainment. So when I was a kid, my two heroes were the professor on Gilligan's Island, right. and Dr. Spock on Star Trek. <laughs> now, how did they come to pass? What yes. are the equivalents today? What can we do to have more of them? But I would like to ask you, with Schmidt Futures in particular, what are the people you're supporting doing science policy and science philanthropy that you're most excited about? What, what's your yeah. value work right now? So I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. So one is uh, uh, Arthi Prabhakar, who's the former uh, director of DARPA. And what she's interested in is uh, <clears throat> this uh, sort of concretizing a, a methodology for what she calls solutions R&D, which is R&D where you're not just trying to, you know, generate a bunch of academic papers, but honest to God, solve a particular problem, which was what DARPA was in the business of doing for national security and applying that to a broader range of societal problems than uh, DARPA's mission, which is create technological surprise for our adversaries uh, and avoid it for the United States. 
And so I think she correctly points out that there's not nearly enough work going on in uh, population level health. Um, so you think about the costs that the U.S. and other countries are going to have to bear uh, on uh, on on diabetes. Uh, that there's not a, enough work going to say how could we take what we're learning about behavioral science, uh, the advent of low cost sensors and machine learning, et cetera, et cetera. Could we take those technologies and that those scientific advances and apply them to preventing diabetes or other chronic diseases in the first place, as opposed to expensive treatments once you have it. So that's one person uh, and her team I'm very excited about. The other is uh, Adam Marblestone, who uh, uh, was a PhD student with George Church uh, and a research scientist with Ed Boyden, both of whom I consider to be uh, what the Japanese would call national treasures. Adam and, and a colleague of his, Sam Rodriguez, have a really interesting idea for these focused research organizations. So these are problems that don't fit well in the private sector because there's no clear path to profitability. They're not a great fit for academia because they require a higher level of team science uh, than is, is uh, typically possible to do in an academic environment because every young scientist has or engineer has to demonstrate their own individual contribution as opposed to what they did as, as part of a tightly coordinated team of you know 20 scientists and engineers working together. And Adam has been going around and, and talking to people about are there some problems uh, that you think we could do we could we could solve that are really really important but don't fit well within the existing funding structures. And the meta point is um, you know, most of the time, if you're an individual and you have an idea, you have to fit it into existing institutions, funding mechanisms, and, and uh, in incentive structures. And what is very powerful is to ask hundreds of really, uh, you know, creative uh, and productive people, what if the world changed to accommodate your idea as opposed to the other way around? Um, and uh, I'll, I'll give you a thought experiment for how I used to uh, ask uh, people that question, which is to imagine that you had had a meeting with President Obama in the Oval Office, and he says, Tyler, if you give me a good idea for uh, accelerating progress studies, then I will call anyone on the planet. Uh, it can be a conference call, so there can be more than one person on the line. All you have to do is tell me what is your idea in order to make it happen. Who would I call and what would I ask them to do? And the motivation for that was that if you have the ability to send the president a decision memo and he checks the box that says yes, if that happens enough times, you develop this very strong sense of agency. So it's a, it's a way of you know, sharing that agency that, that you develop over time with someone else. There's also, a, a, uh, it's also important because I think a lot of important problems require building coalitions and it's very difficult to build a coalition if you can't articulate, number one, who are the members of the coalition? And number two, what are the mutually reinforcing steps that you're asking them to take? Uh, and that reduces to, if you could call anyone, who would you call and what would you ask them to do? So as Tyler, as you find people who may have hypotheses about the answer to that question, you should drop me a line. I might call you, first of all, <laughs> and I might want to call President Obama. So <laughs> my answers are contained within the question. But I have a question for you, my thought experiment. Mm -hmm. What is it you would like the universities to do differently? Yes, yes. you can say more interest in science, but a systemic yes. change at the institutional level. You get to press the button. One thing, it can be better, given all that you've learned, how are we screwing up? He set us right. Yeah, so I would like it. Uh, I, I think that this this idea of these university adjacent research nonprofit organizations uh, that are, are are working on a problem that that you can't do through the typical very loose collaboration between academics uh, is is a tool that we should be adding to our science policy toolkit 
And I think one of the things that would enable that is if universities had a uh, were more relaxed about letting uh, professors go on a sabbatical to do something like that, and then they could come back uh, after this was over, as opposed to saying, "Well, I've got to make a choice: do I participate in this like very intense, focused effort to solve this particular problem, like a climate change problem, or?" Uh, you know, a pandemic problem, but when I'm really all in, I'm not doing anything else. I'm not going to academic Senate meetings. I'm just really focused on solving this problem. Um, could a university have a more uh, liberal sabbatical policy that would allow someone to 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 leave and and come back, as opposed to saying, "I've got to sever my relationships with the institution." So that 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 would be high on my list. I also at the education level. We talk a lot about how we want people who are T-shaped. They have depth in one area, but they have enough breadth to be able to participate in cross-functional teams. And when you see universities currently doing this, um, their notion is, well, you major in one thing, but you minor in another academic discipline. So uh, University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana has a CS plus X program where you major in CS and then you minor in philosophy or, or something like that. Uh, but what if the top T, top of the T was a problem? So you major in a discipline, but you minor in a problem, whether it's safe drinking water or improving our ability to respond to future pandemics or whatever. Um, and so you have a set of curricular, co-curricular, and experiential learning opportunities that are really designed with that problem as the central organizing principle, as opposed to another academic discipline. And I think if we had more of those people they could be some of the change makers that we need in the 21st century because you know universities have disciplines but the world has problems and and we should treat those as important central organizing principles in the same way that uh michael crow is creating entire new schools at arizona state university one of the few presidents who's genuinely committed to serious institutional experimentation where the central organizing principle of that school is not an academic discipline. It's a real world problem like sustainability. So I'd like to see more of that as well. And let me give you another button. I, I would second everything you said, by the way. You can change one thing in science policy, in government, not more money for something. Sure. It's too easy. But something yeah. procedural or something institutional. Which button do you press? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> um, I would say, you know, this this might be the equivalent of, uh, you know, asking the genie for more wishes. Um, but <laughs> you, you press I would the button say, for more button. I, I would, I, well, I, I guess if you allow me more than one. Uh, so one would be in the same way that we have a set aside for small business R&D. What if we had a set aside for uh, experimentation? So we said we're going to take some non-zero percentage of the uh, of the NSF budget or the NIH budget, and we're going to use it to experiment in in more uh, in, for example, <clears throat> what group processes are most effective at supporting um, higher risk but potentially transformative ideas. Um, so so I think that would be that would be an example. Another example is. Um, I just like to see us be more ambitious. Um, and so in the same way that, you know, the Department of Energy launched the SunShot initiative, which was uh, make solar cheaper than coal, and uh, USAID launched a project to dramatically reduce newborn uh, and maternal mortality in the first 48 hours after birth. Um, I think every major science agency uh, should be involved in the identification and pursuit of at least one of these really ambitious goals. So for for example, for BARDA, it, it, uh, it might be how far could we reduce the time required to develop a new vaccine which is safe and effective using platform approaches as opposed to starting from scratch every time you have a new emerging infectious disease. So every science agency should be involved in the identification and pursuit of uh, at least one 21st century moonshot. Last question. If we, we have like a minute apiece for this, 
if we just think of science, what's an area that right now is underrated and it's going to pay off the time and maybe not fully on people's radar screens? What's your one minute answer? Uh, I would say the combination of behavioral science and technology is, is underrated. For me, I think spillovers from the current war against COVID on the vaccine front, the vaccine acceleration front, the antibody front in immunology and fighting viruses are going to have big payoffs over the next 20 years that most people aren't aware of yet. Yeah, no, I think that's true. I think that's very plausible. And I also think we need to do a massive after action review and say, you know, what did we learn from what went poorly, both on the uh, what new tools don't we have? Like we should have N99.99 masks. We should have the ability to create safe spaces uh, for transportation and uh, and office buildings and, and factories. So that I think there's a bunch of things that we just underinvested in uh, because of the somewhat you know, arbitrary structure of, of disciplines and funding agencies. I believe we're about out of time. Tom, thank you. All listeners, thank you. Everyone at Lincoln, uh, thank you. It's been a great uh, pleasure. Look forward to seeing you in the flesh. All right. Great to see you, Tyler, and super questions as always. Great. Take care.